Welcome everyone. Welcome to the uh, tonight's major event with uh, Peter Coffey. This is uh, uh, for many years was an annual event, uh, a joint meeting between ACM and AITP where uh, Peter Coffey shares trends and in innovation and disruptive technologies. But uh, first, uh, a few words about AITP LA and our board. Uh, we've got a, a strong board this year. Uh, we've got Rick Peterson as president. He's our, also our resident Zoom expert. He's uh, keeping the chapter moving ahead, embracing new technologies, and he's also our publicity chair. Uh, Nilu Tao is our program's co-chair, and she's focused on improving our members' experience, providing stimulating and relevant program content, and she's also the co-facilitator of tonight's webinar. Mitch Masmura, our VP, is an advocate of our senior management-oriented events. Joan Samuels, our membership and professional development person, and also a location scout for in-person events, which will happen one of these days. Uh, Carol Schlocker for programs, a loyal board member and an indefatigable ideas person. Greg Klinger is our technology guru, who is a longtime board member, and he keeps our website current, accurate, and secure. I also want to mention Stephen Laughlin, our past president, who has been a significant mentor to our board. So there's a few benefits that accrue to uh, membership. Uh, AITP, uh, the, the acronym stands for Association of Information Technology Professionals. We hold regular meetings uh, when they're in person, they're in West LA. Uh, the focus is on keeping members abreast of trends and best practices in managing technology and encouraging ideas for innovation, as well as providing strong networking opportunities. So we hold monthly meetings with networking when they're in person. Uh, they're free during the safer at home period we offer soft skills and training workshops. We support local conferences and we provide leadership opportunities. So if you join the chapter and, and, and get active on the board, you can do things you may never have done. Uh, you can help us strengthen the chapter's reputation and extend our reach. Uh, you can take responsibility for uh, making a program happen. Uh, get to know people who are in experts in areas that you're interested in. There's lots of things that you can do as a member of the chapter. We're also part of a national organization and there's a, a national uh, element to membership, uh, which we can talk about more, more in the future. Uh, so for now, uh, I'll turn it over to Nilu who will explain the rules for participation tonight. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to this special virtual event today. So just few logistics on the webinar before we get started uh, with the actual event. If you have any uh, technical questions or if you need any assistance, you can message in the chat. And if you have any questions, we will try to answer your questions during the event or after the event, you can type that in the Q&A session and also this recording we are going to post on our AITP LA website after the event is over so you can feel free to check it out there also. Okay, great. And now uh, just a few words to introduce Peter Coffey. Uh, Peter Coffey is now Vice President for Strategic Research at Salesforce.com. He currently spends most of his time with customers assisting their acceleration of digital transformation timelines in response to the global pandemic. He joined salesforce.com in 2007 after 19 years with PC Week and eWeek as a columnist and labs analyst. In 2007, Salesforce stock was about $10 per share and it's now almost $200 per share. So I calculated that as a 28% average annual growth and so we conclude that he must be having a positive impact on their bottom line. If you're interested in following Peter Coffey uh, on Twitter, it's simply his name, uh, at P 
Peter Coffey. So with that, I will introduce Peter Coffey. Thank you so much, Roger. It's great to be with you all again. It was always one of the highlights of my year to see you folks at your first meeting after your summer break. It was an important meeting for me because it forced me to do a complete refresh of my content every year. I never wanted to show you folks the same thing twice unless, of course, I was acknowledging that I'd gotten it wrong, in which case we tried to figure out why, or maybe possibly doubling down and having gotten something right, in which case I might want to indicate whether I thought it was going to continue or whether I thought it was a trend that had run its course. Uh, it's been, I guess, now two years since the last time we, uh, no, three years. We did this in the fall of 2017. Um, and then uh, my wife retired and our grandchildren are up here in the Seattle area. So I haven't been in the uh, area since then very often. But, uh, but since everything is now pretty much location independent, uh, it's, it's great to have a chance to, to do this again. And as we were discussing earlier, the, the degree to which uh, telemeeting is going to be a durable normal from now on may, may result in it being possible for me to join you more routinely from now on. Um, it's likely that I'll go until about uh, seven o'clock Pacific time tonight. We promised you pretty much the, the four course meal uh, tonight because this is an association of IT professionals, which means we need to cover ground that includes core technology, uh, administrative practice, adoption of technologies, and of course your responsibilities in many cases as organizational leaders to have a well-founded point of view and strategy on a reopening of workplaces and customer spaces a question of you know, what is the, the workplace norm going forward. So with all of that uh, in, in mind, and with the expectation that I'll probably be wrapped up by seven, but we'll all stick around for, for questions to follow. Um, Roger, perhaps you can confirm for me that you folks are seeing the, uh, the ever popular Salesforce contour map? Yes. Very good, then I'll continue. Well, the last two years have been extraordinary. Uh, I, I so supposedly moved to Seattle, but I've been hardly here at all traveling an average of about 200 days a year during that time. And it's really difficult to imagine the, the carbon footprint and the, the general you know, gay mad world of, um, of, of being able to spend time in the Nordics and in Asia and the chance to be with people who are all basically solving similar problems of achieving customer engagement, but at the same time being a little bit oblivious to prior global history of things like pandemics I get a little bit impatient with people who will say things like, oh, well, nothing could have prepared us for this because this is actually the closing credit sequence of Rise of Planet of the Apes in 2011, when in the last uh, several minutes of the movie, they diagram in colorful animation, the spread of a global pandemic, which of course tees up the, uh, the takeover of the other primate species of planet in the subsequent movies, because this was prequel to the original Planet of the Apes. And it's difficult to remember that on March 10th, someone's diary showed the first appearance in their business correspondence of the word coronavirus because some cups were gonna be delayed coming from China. And they thought, okay, this is gonna be a nuisance, it'll be over soon. It was such a short time ago that we had such a narrow and inaccurate conception of how large a problem this would be and how long it would last. Now, of course, that was six months ago. And I know where I was on March 1st, I was in a hotel in Indianapolis getting ready to meet with customers when the memo came out saying, wherever you're gonna to be tomorrow, get it done and get on a plane and go home. Whatever you had planned for the rest of the week, forget it, we're, we're going into lockdown here. The problem is you can't hit pause indefinitely. Uh, the younger generation will never know the warnings that we used to get about, don't leave a VCR on pause for a long time, you'll wear out the tape. You know, we, we don't have that metaphor anymore. But there are things that can't be paused indefinitely. The, the notion of suspended animation is still only science fiction. You still have to hire and onboard people. You have people retiring. You have to hand off their responsibilities. You're going to be introducing new products. You hope you'll be acquiring new customers. Perishable inventories are a thing. Collections and payments are definitely a thing. And uh, this is something I stole basically from Peter Drucker that profit is kind of a, you know, whatever you want it to be. You can do your bookkeeping and make your profits what you want. But cash flow is a fact. Everything else is literature. Cash flow is nonfiction. And you can function for days without food and hours without water, but only minutes without a pulse. And the real question, what is the pulse of your organization? What are the things that you suspend at your peril? How quickly must we get into a mode of a sustainable process that can last for many more weeks, months, and possibly to some degree years? Because there are gonna be aspects of the new 
pandemic risk compatible ways of doing business, education, government, and so on, that will be with us probably for decades or more. It's especially important to be having this conversation right now because research literally from Antarctica to the space station has shown that when people are in conditions of high stress and confinement, the halfway point is critical. It doesn't really matter if it's a six month mission in Antarctica or a six week missile submarine patrol time, the halfway mark is the mark at which the adrenaline buzz of can I do this begins to wear off and the how do we keep doing this question starts to arise and the psychology of that is a challenge. Uh, this was uh, remarked upon by Douglas Adams in the famous fictional book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There was one particular planet, Magrathia, that just said, well, the heck with this. We'll just put ourselves all into suspended animation and have the computers linked to the galactic stock market. When the economy has been rebuilt by everyone else, the computers will wake us up when they can afford our expensive services. You know, that really isn't going to work. The perception that you just hung a sign on the door saying, gone fishing, um, we'll, we'll be back with our doors open when you're ready to buy things from us is not the vibe you want to be sending right now. You want to be as David Brooks at the Atlantic Monthly and New York Times has said, they're sibling from the same canoe. You want your customers, partners, ecosystem members to see you as someone who was there when things were tough, providing leadership, providing assistance, and being a collaborator in getting the game going again. It's a pretty unpleasant way to behave, to just let everybody else do the hard stuff, and then you come in when, when the party is ready to resume. You know, it's easy to overlook the fact that we spent, in some ways, the last 20 years getting ready for this. And from my friend Phil Wainwright over at the United Kingdom site, Diginomica, dredged up this quote, that there are decades where nothing happens and weeks where decades happen. And he pointed out that things that we've been laying the foundations to do in areas like massive investment in bandwidth, educating the world on how to use platforms like Facebook or for that matter, Zoom, as we are doing now, the readiness to do this created an enormous latent capability, which in some cases needed just a little bit of a nudge to make decades of change happen in a matter of weeks. For example, I had people in financial services in the UK say in a webinar the other day, that their 50 to 70 year old customers are now suddenly showing up as users of mobile banking technology, not because the technology suddenly got better, but for the first time, their familiar practice of going to the office and saying hello to the bank tellers and so on, now that's no longer possible. And the latent capability was always there, ready to have the trigger pulled. But fun fact, this, this amazing quote, decades where nothing happens, weeks where decades happen, is from someone not normally quoted in the business schools, the ever popular Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, uh, and uh, people who say, oh, that Marxist. No, a Marxist is an economist. Lenin was a revolutionary, and there is a big, big difference. But as Phil observed, we spent decades getting ready for what we now have to actually do, which is adapt behavior, adapt business models, adapt entire cultures of customer interaction to deal with this environment in which this kind of communication is going to be necessary for quite some time to come. I am not here to say it's going to be easy. Winston Churchill famously said, if you're going through hell, keep going. Do, do, do not stop to maunder on about how difficult it is and do not stop to congratulate yourself on how well you're doing either. It is easy at this point to be, as one might say, polishing the apple of how well we've handled this and not notice that we need to you get those things back off of pause, get, get back into the mode of workforce management and engagement, new customer acquisition, and so on. There are things that my friend Joe McKendrick at uh, ZDNet accurately observed make 2025 here 60 months early. And everything that we are having to do, I, I don't know anyone who hasn't agreed that the things we're doing now, we would have done in the next two to five years. We would have been using more digital engagement, more remote learning, more work from anywhere. It would have happened. But now the five-year plan has to get done in the next five months. The two-year plan may be in the next two weeks. Do not think that this can be solved by turning the clock back. If someone says, well, the problem is we had a global supply chain, so let's uh, go back to domestic sourcing. No, that's trying to make time run backwards really not going to work. 
In some cases, the thing that you would like to go back to literally doesn't exist anymore. You may not have the option of returning to domestic supply if the global supply chain has resulted in there simply being no domestic source for what you're talking about buying anymore. And crucially, your customers now know they can have something better. And that's what's really going to be key. A lot of people have been told over the years by their managers, oh, your job doesn't really lend itself to remote work from home. We're going to need you in the office every day. And now they can look the boss back in the eye and say, excuse me, you know, I've been doing this for the last three months. You're going to have a hard time convincing me that this can't be my norm from now on. The folks at McKinsey put this very, very well. There is some degree of silver lining in the fact that many of us now have license to experiment, license to try things that would have been considered too radical, too difficult, too skills intensive. And in a lot of cases, people are looking around and saying, the last crisis in 08, 09, the technology really just wasn't very good. Trying to do this kind of thing that we're doing right now, 10 years ago, was clumsy. Bandwidth was limited. People's devices weren't really capable of working well. They didn't have the habits and the norms. And discovering that you can do this at this kind of tempo is a discovery that I encourage people to embrace. And to put it very simply, get off the pause button, hit play, and then as quickly as possible, move to fast forward. Because the people who will be content with their behavior during these months, five years from now, will be the ones who got the fast forward button pressed as soon as they possibly could. So if you're wondering if there was gonna be a title slide for this talk, we've gotten to it now. This is about the steps we can and must take today and about the leaps that are gonna to be tomorrow. And I do mean tomorrow, not some distant tomorrow. I mean, literally when you go to work tomorrow morning, there are things that I want you to be actively moving forward that you, that you might've thought were you know, months or years away and to realize the technology plays an important role. But I'm also gonna be making it quite clear that leadership and cultural processes are gonna be really key. And your ability to be a leader of people and a change agent in your organization is going to be tremendously important. Salesforce is a publicly traded company. I may make reference today to some things that are not yet generally available from us. Please don't let those influence your decisions about doing business with us or investing in us. And you can read all of this in all of its glory on our investor relations website, if that's your idea of a good time. We use the expression sometimes the elephant in the room. Well, sometimes the elephant is a natural disaster. It comes in, makes a mess and leaves. And you clean up and you know you can you proceed. This time the elephant is gonna sit down and make itself comfortable for months or possibly years. When you know the elephant is going to make itself at home, you'd better invest in some stronger furniture maybe bigger doorways and rearrange the furniture to, to accommodate. And that's what we need to do. This recovery is not gonna be down and back up. This is not gonna be like a tornado coming through town and the rebuilding is a, is a well-defined project. In fact, the shape of this curve and of its echo curves, depending on reinfection behavior, has been compared to the Nike swoosh logo. I like that word better than you know, the, the reverse square root sign recovery. No, 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 this is the swoosh recovery. And it's no longer a projection. The, the, the curves I'm showing you here, well, those were OECD projections a few months ago, but already we see this happening. For example, this is data off of people's mobile phones in the UK when they reopened all the bars and, uh, and tap rooms. And the return when all the hospitality and, uh, operations went open again is still a substantial percentage reduction. It's not going to be a quick bounce back recovery. People may change their spending behavior. They may change their risk awareness. We have to build this in a way that can handle a gradual and possibly uh, sequential, you know, multiple steps of recovery. And we have to get very, very global about this. Anyone who says anything about the recovery should immediately be challenged as to in which part of the world, in which industry, with what timing, what are the assumptions you're making? Because the curve up there uh, in green for China, yes, you're not um, seeing an optical illusion here. They are already now back to a level of economic activity greater than they were at at the end of 2019. Their recovery has been more than complete in that regard. Uh, but in the, uh, the so-called advanced economies, it might seem perverse that the pink curve for the advanced economies is the worst. I believe the reason is, and the research I've been seeing is consistent with the idea that 
the advanced economies will have the slowest recovery because they have the most margin in the first place. They've got the largest fraction of their workers able to work from home. They've got the largest fraction of their students able to participate in remote learning. And so since they don't have to find ways to get back into physical workspaces and customer spaces, it may actually be a longer period of time before those economies return to full vigor. And if you're in the hospitality industries or travel and tourism or professional sports, that leisurely return of, of that pink curve is gonna be a great concern to you. It is not enough just to clean up your own room. When you look at this globally, you realize that apart from the US, which is having some nasty you know, third order uh, re-peaking of the curve, the advanced economies generally have turned the corner, but look at that pale blue curve that's just soaring for the infections in the emerging markets. Why am I harping on that? Because most of us don't live there. Well, we sort of do. This is a list of the countries that are considered emerging market economies by the IMF. And I've marked out four that might seem to be kind of random, Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, and Vietnam. Why those? Well, apart from Canada, those four represent the top uh, five of our coffee imports for consumption into the United States. So if you want a cup of coffee on your desk tomorrow morning, whether or not the workers in Colombia, Brazil, Vietnam, and Guatemala are showing up and able to work productively is of, of more than, shall we say, academic interest to you. Starbucks has their actual geographic map of what their supply chain looks like, but the folks at The Economist put it in really crisp terms when they said, that cup of coffee on your desk in the morning had 29 companies in 18 countries in some way involved in getting it there. Can I get along without my cup of coffee in the morning? I don't know if I want to try, but let's talk about something a little bit more important like vaccines. Getting a vaccine into volume production makes making a cup of coffee look very, very easy by comparison. These are some of the functions, just some of the key functions that the World Health Organization has identified as part of getting billions of doses of vaccine out into the world, estimating the need, coordination, the systems, the supply chain, the cold chain to keep vaccines viable over long distances. They can't be frozen, they just have to be kept cold, and monitoring to be sure that happens. If you wanna get a sense of just how difficult this is going to be, one of the key ingredients in vaccines is an extract from the soap bark tree, which is harvested in three South American countries during the Southern Hemisphere's southern months. Uh, southern Hemisphere's summer months, excuse me. And the last time they did the November harvest, coronavirus had not yet shown up in the inbox of that pub keeper in uh, London. And the next November harvest doesn't come for several months to come. This is going to be tricky. The other thing that's unusual is that Normally, the vaccine process follows a fairly linear routine. You test, you start producing, then you produce in greater volume, and so on. This one is different. Anything that looks like a viable molecule, they're already ramping up the capacity to produce in great volume simultaneously and in parallel. And if it turns out that it works, great. And if it doesn't, well, that, then that's going to be discarded. But the Decisions that are being made from a supply chain point of view are quite unlike anything we've seen before. And then, of course, there's the supply chain for the glass vials. And don't forget the soap bark trees. When things are in a steady state, you don't notice that their start times and stop times are very different in speed. Something that needs a three-month period to get started up from zero to full volume compared to something that needs three days. Well, it doesn't really matter if everything is steady state, but if everything gets stopped, at the beginning of March, largely everything got stopped, or April for sure. Well, now when you want to do the restart, you discover the synchronization issues. And so the visibility of your supply chain, the, the need to go beyond seasonal cycle forecast behaviors to being genuinely data-driven and genuinely shared truth-based. These are things that have been goals for a long time. But the idea that we need to build not merely processes, but actual data structures in which we are all genuinely informed by the same truth at the same time with a high level of trust in the quality and integrity and security of that data. This is why technologies like blockchain, a word I usually avoid because blockchain is a special case of the more general idea of a distributed ledger, these are going to be key because they allow us to have shared data 
without anyone being gatekeeper and toll collector for that data, it can shorten transaction times. It's in tests in the financial services industry, for example, three-day security transaction settlement times have been shrunk to order of tens of seconds. And getting that under control is one of the things that we are going to find tremendously useful to do over these coming months. And the fact that blockchain technologies are now in widespread use is going to turn out to be one of the most important levers we can pull for this recovery. And just because I would like to know, poll question number one, which we'll share with you now, I'd like to know kind of where, where are you in your organization, in your application of uh, blo blockchain type technologies? Are, are we bringing up uh, poll one at this time? Um, which is going to be asking you to assess, you know, well, what's, what is my current uh, use of blockchain? Am I exploring it? Am I deploying it? Are we actively using it or are we still just reading about it? And well, we used to read about it in in-flight magazines. We don't have those anymore. But I would very much like to know um, uh, where, where you folks all sit on that. And uh, Nilo, you'll let me know when it's appropriate to uh, proceed. Right, so we are still getting numbers. People are still voting. As a host and panel or panelist, I can't actually vote, so I'm not allowed to cook the books here. <laughs> so here we have the results. So That's you a can... <laughs> big whopping none, and I can't say I'm surprised. Well. <laughs> Uh, that's one thing I'd like you to do tomorrow morning is, is have a, ch a chat with your financial, uh, your logistics, um, and you know, any, anyone else with whom you have you know, data sharing or data integration tasks and ask the question, are there things we could be, should be exploring to move not to a faster version of what we've had before, but to something genuinely different? Because frankly, updating what has failed us to date is not really where I want to go. Let's do something better. Let's talk about, for example, existing situations in which implicit silos result in your new customers being given better prices than your established customers, simply because your established customers were on your legacy systems and your new customers were on the new systems. This is an actual you know, story uh, told by my friend Joe McKendrick over at uh, ZDNet. I think he wrote this one for Forbes. Uh, Blockchain data has the security built in, the provenance is built in. It really is an important technical change from traditional bat database models. It's being used in production right now in China to distribute business loans on a, on a cross-border platform. So this is reality. And it's being tested in um, oil and gas operations. It's being used for aerospace parts, which have to carry, as they've been called, birth certificates to certify their production uh, conditions and, and inspections being passed. This is real. And, I, and anyone who thinks that blockchain is, is a futuristic idea or too exotic for them um, is mistaken. And, and I urge you to be evaluating these questions about whether existing blockchain platforms are available. We have one, not yet in general availability, uh, that is being actively tested in education, finance, and um, healthcare. Other viable blockchain platforms exist, including some from partners of ours. And so this is not an, an emerging technology. This is in production at large scale right now. And I, and I hope that that'll be one of the takeaways from this evening. Be, do, be, be very carefully warned, as, as the great philosopher Elmer Fudd said, be very, very careful when someone comes to you and says, I've got a blockchain for you. There are certain attributes, and you're going to have access to this material later, so I won't you know, narrate this entire slide. There are five characteristics of a distributed ledger technology system. This is a great report done by University of Cambridge. And if it fails on any of these five criteria, it may be a very nice, large-scale, high-availability distributed database. It's not a distributed ledger. And if it doesn't meet these characteristics, you should say to people, look, I'm sorry, we're not going to invest a lot of money in a refined version of a technology that does not bring us these essential characteristics of, of trust, guaranteed integrity, guaranteed provenance of the data. You need to be moving forward on this. It's a very old idea. The discussion of this data traces back to the 1990s, and I don't think you'll be surprised to know that blockchain really become po a popular topic only when Bitcoin came along. These are Google Trends searches for search activity of, of a blockchain down there in the blue, which is actually useful, and Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency. Uh, if you would like a, my short form opinion on cryptocurrencies, 
I'll point out that a currency needs to be a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. Cryptocurrencies generally fail all three, as witnessed the fact that the World Bitcoin Conference would not let you pay your registration fee in, wait for it, Bitcoin. Yeah, you saw that one coming. And digital currencies like Facebook's notion of Libra have been quite controversial among regulators. Meanwhile, the use of blockchain platforms to do well-established tasks like financial settlement, as, as again, you, you, I talked earlier about taking a 30-minute settlement time and shrinking it down to you know, single-digit minutes, these are meaningful, uh, genuinely valuable things to be done that well-established brands like Swift are going to be adopting. So if you think the blockchain's a future thing, well, let's let the future be tomorrow morning. Now, moving on, I've already talked about the degree to which we can't think of this as incident recovery. These are not you know, short-lived episodes of nuisance that we're going to get over in no time. We have to think of these as cycles. This is a great graph from the uh, Hong Kong Baptist University on their business continuity management cycle, a continuing assessment of what are the current risks, what is the relevant strategy, what are the continuity measures that can be applied, evaluate, and crucially, continue. Never declare victory on your, on your risk readiness. This graph, when I saw it, reminded me so much of this diagram from the Air Force where the late Colonel John Boyd called it his OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act, to teach fighter pilots how not to get shot down. Many companies have observation and decision and think that that's what IT does orientation, the continual evaluation of your environment and new competitors and entirely new competitive models emerging, that's a new discipline. And translating this into action by pushing the information out to the field is not the area where enterprise IT has traditionally been emphasized. Not by any coincidence at all, this uh, very similar graph uh, appeared on the um, briefing of my uh, uh, Governor Inslee here in Washington recently to talk about the whole method of contact tracing as a remediation for the, the present situation. A constant, tightly looped cycle in which you're never done and you're always getting better. Now, don't, oh, I'm not, I don't mean to oversimplify this because this OODA loop, well, when you actually look at it in a real world situation, there are noise sources, there are erroneous data sources, there are distorted decision processes that are worked by what people want to believe is going to be the outcome. So I don't mean to suggest that just because it's a cycle means it's simple, but the, the relentless orientation toward a constant cycle of continued assessment and response is, is a discipline that can be taught in any organization. Busting the silos is key. If you, if you do this by optimizing the behavior of separate business units or separate pieces of an organization, it's unlikely to produce a good outcome. This is something that's been learned in airline flight operations where perfectly good working airplanes crash when there's multiple people on the flight deck and each of them thought someone else was doing something or each of them thought it was their job and they did it in ways that got in each other's way, either way. And so multi-crew coordination is now being taught as a discipline to flight crews, not by any coincidence at all. This is also being recognized in healthcare, where individually correct actions by different specialists can produce very unfortunate patient outcomes, if not properly coordinated. And again, the nature of IT is such that the data your organization owns, the decisions you make, the outcomes for which you are evaluated and compensated, can individually all be separately optimized and you'll all think you're doing your job. The higher level task of overall organization performance is often implied, but not really intentionally managed. This is not solved by the way, by having more meetings. One of the things we're having right now happen is that it's so easy to call a meeting from people who no longer even need to drive across town, let alone get on a plane, that there are lots of meetings. So here's a great um, flowchart that I got from Harvard Business Review on should I hold a meeting? Have I thought this through? If not, schedule time to think about it. Do I need outside input? If no, then schedule time for getting it done. Don't call a meeting. Does moving forward require a real-time conversation? And if not, send an email. Does it really need a face-to-face -face meeting? And if not, schedule something else. And yes, notice how many gates you had to go through to schedule and prepare for an actual meeting or even a video meeting. Make meetings special.
expect that people will have reviewed the information in advance. At Amazon, if you show up for a meeting and you haven't done your pre-reading, you're basically invited to leave the room and come back in when you're ready to you know, sit at the grown-ups table. Because meetings are used as mechanisms to force people to carve out time to think or to force people to get their information together. Well, my feeling is that the best way to end any meeting is to be able to say, the agenda said we were gonna make these decisions. These are the decisions we've made. You'll get the notes before the end of the day and you all get 10 minutes back because we ended early. Thank you, wash your hands. This is the way that meetings should be ending today. If this were short term, if we only had to get through three months of this, we could do this the easy way. And the problem is too many people have been doing it the easy way. And to uh, borrow from Andrew Hill over at the Financial Times, they are at risk of having ad hoc become bad hoc, that they will have implemented a straightforward, ungoverned, insecure, unscalable solution because they could do it quickly and they will not have thought it through. And they will wind up months from now with this practice embedded in their organization. So take enough time to think about, will we be able to live with this for months or years before someone says, well, this is how we're going to take care of this. It's critical because the complexity of systems today is still catching people by surprise. There was a ship on the way to the East Coast that had a cyber incident, whereupon the Coast Guard had to put out a memo to uh, ship um, operators saying, well, you really should be following some basic cybersecurity protocols on your boats. I want to know what's a basic cybersecurity protocol. Maybe, maybe the word password cannot be used as a password. Is that a basic protocol? And what is this word encouraging, as opposed to you know, mandating or, or warning people your life is at risk? if you don't manage the software parts of your systems with, with rigor and diligence. Uh, and if you want a great example, the fast chargers that are so great because they sense the condition of your battery and uh, can get a battery charged in you know, maybe 20 or 30 minutes instead of four or five hours. Well, it turns out that those things have microprocessors in them, which are subject to malware attack. And they can actually make your phone melt or catch fire. This is what happens when consumer technology is allowed to do important things and it's not treated as an attack surface for whether mischievous or state level actors. And if you want another great example of what happens when we get ahead of ourselves in this regard, there are black sites in Afghanistan that are not supposed to appear on any maps that aren't classified, which are now diagrammed in loving detail on the public websites of fitness wearable tools because the soldiers were wearing their fitness bands when they were working out and going to dinner and whatnot. So now not only do we know where the site is, we even know when all the guys are in the mess hall at the same time and we can take them out with one smart bomb. This is what happens when the technology gets ahead of the governance. And when there is no book that says you may not wear your Wi-Fi connected internet uh, uh, in interacting fitness wearable on the base. They just hadn't caught up. It's what I call a shockwave effect, where the, the noise of the plane doesn't reach your ears until after the supersonic aircraft has already passed overhead. This is critical. This, this, this matters a lot because just the other day, this is uh, July 17th, DHS had to put out a warning to all government agencies. They had 24 hours to apply an update to one of their servers if they didn't want them to be taken over and turned into rogue DNS servers. This kind of thing is still happening. Uh, there are devices that are being shipped with a default password that's burned into a ROM chip and can't be changed, which makes it really difficult to apply good security practices here. And people are still making silly mistakes like a one line error that resulted in an enormous fraction of the internet having a border gateway incident uh, just last week, this is dated July 20th, and wound up with many large websites being inoperative for quite some period of time. The systems still aren't being architected and administered for resilience. We want them to be, because when we connect things together and we do it well with good governance and with a good customer experience, really amazing things happen. For example, that Apple Watch that some of you may be wearing, now by far the best selling watch brand in the US. And three of the top five watch brands are smart watch brands, you know, bigger, bigger than Rolex. They're capable of extraordinary things. 
There was a guy who was you know, mountain biking, fell, was knocked unconscious. His son, several miles you know, down the trail, found out that his dad had had an accident because the dad's watch detected the fall, asked him if he was okay. When it got no answer, the watch told the phone to call for emergency responders who had the guy on the way to the hospital before his son managed to get back there to the place where the accident had occurred. And then when he arrived at the hospital, again, he got a text telling him that his location in the hospital had changed. This is no longer Tom Swift and his you know, futuristic hardware. This is real hardware that people are wearing every day, pulling off these extraordinary magic tricks of, of cross-system awareness and making people safer and, and more healthy in the real world. This is why John Hancock has now stopped selling life insurance policies that don't incorporate some measure of risk assessment based on data from wearable tech. Because why would you handicap yourself that way? Why would you try to assess people's risk by old fashioned methods like whether they lied about how much they drank or lied about how long it's been since they smoked? Now you can measure and measurement is a key. Connected communities create new models of competition. You thought you knew who your competitors were because you read the yellow pages and there they all are on the same page as you. Not so much anymore because now Customers discover your new competitor through viral experiences. It was a long time before Airbnb ever did any conventional advertising. Uber advertises more to get new drivers than they advertise to get passengers. Getting this done matters because you've got people who don't have any loyalty to your institution, who, you know, millennials who said back in 2014 that they would be fine with banking with Apple or Google. They don't care that they're not banks as far as they're concerned. They're the, the nervous system and connective tissue in which they live their lives, so why not let them handle the money? And guess what? Now we've got the Apple card, and we've got the Walmart card, which architect important business objectives. When you're paying with an Apple card, there's all sorts of stuff now that integrates you into the Apple device ecosystem. The Walmart card, Notice that they give you a 5% cash back if you buy online, only 2% in the store. They're doing financial engineering of their customers to steer them toward the business platform in which their profits are greater. It's a, it's, it's a beautifully architected solution, meets people's needs, and it kind of disintermediates the traditional banks. And the, the banks are no fools. They're, they're looking at this hard. You look at the uh, degree to which now your credit card companies don't compete on interest rates. They compete on, can we get you tickets to the concert that no one else can? They're building ecosystems of experience around the act of payment instead of just trying to improve the act of payment itself. Not incidentally, if you're gonna have this many partners interacting, so one single transaction might now involve an entertainment partner, a payment partner, a transportation partner, and a dining partner, well, things like smart contract capability of blockchain platforms are going to be involved in this. So this all ties together. The kinds of experience that are needed, the kinds of integration across disciplines that are required to meet the medical situation, all of these things require new data architectures to make them work. This is the question about who is your competitor going forward. My friend uh, David uh, McInnish at uh, Adobe said, I'm uh, sorry, ADP said once, when Google decides to come into your market, they don't just eat your lunch. You wake up in the morning and they're making breakfast in your kitchen. And discovering that an Amazon or a Google or an eBay or a PayPal or a Square has decided nice little business there, we'll take it from here, is, is not a morning you wanna have. Now, when these behemoths of data aggregation and experience become as comprehensive as they do, interesting things happen. You're not going to be able to read the words, but these are the lengths of the privacy policies of Google over time in 1999, 2009, and 2019. The kind of use they're making of our data has people concerned, and reasonably so, because even if you think you know what you've disclosed, the ability of massive computation to find knowledge in your data that you didn't know you were giving up is astonishing. There is work that's been done at MIT that shows that with six credit card transactions, 
no identifying information, just the fact of the six transactions, you can identify home and workplace, home address by for 93%, workplace address for 56% of users. How do you do that? Well, I can buy anonymous data from a cell phone company that does not attach my name to a phone number. And yet a phone leaves my home address every morning, or at least it used to. My home address is a matter of public record. That's not hard to find. It goes to the company where I'm known to work. That's not very hard to find. And oh, this is interesting. This phone that almost every day goes back and forth between Peter's home address and Peter's office, every two weeks it goes to, an, um, it goes to a cancer clinic. Oh, well, that's something that I might want to know. I'm not allowed to know it. I'm not allowed to ask it. But all of a sudden, I've got a pretty strong hypothesis that Peter is seeing a cancer specialist. You know, that's the kind of data that laws like HIPAA are supposed to make, very difficult to get. It doesn't take much computational power today applied to massive publicly available databases to infer things that many people believe they've got safely protected. The real world knowledge is gonna come from real world observation. I mean, there are some things you can get from a database, but look at Apple. I talked about fall detection and the fact that the guy's Apple watch knew he'd had a fall on his bike. Uh, Apple went out and studied 2,500 people over a period of years to figure out what does the data look like from someone falling. That's going to be one of the real competitive differentiators going forward is people who know stuff. And it's key because Delta Airlines, for example, had to, had to teach the Air Force how to use all of their logging and transactional data on their planes to be able to feed that data into AI machine learning for things like preventive diagnostics. You might think that's very exotic. Well, according to Deloitte research, the typical company would need to integrate data from 39 different sources. The typical company, 39 sources. That's not the worst case. Just to have an idea of what their integrated customer experience looks like. Tying data together to create actual knowledge does not happen by accident. And it's going to be crucial because when people use data models in careless ways, when the tool is too simple, when people don't know the limitations of the tool, they can produce wildly ridiculous predictions and results. And if you want a great example, there's a website called Spurious Correlations that will show you astonishing correlations. And I don't just mean two things both going up at the same time. I mean actual wiggles and dips that seem to coincide between phenomena like non-commercial space launches and sociology doctorates. I don't think there's any predictive power in that correlation. I really don't. And I don't think there's any actual theoretical um, insight to be gained. It's an accident of history, but it's a very cheap thing to discover. And the world is now awash in easily discoverable, misleading correlations. This matters because the technology of AI is really no longer the problem. Company culture not recognizing the need, lack of data or quality issues, these are the real problems. And so introducing AI into your organization is going to be much more about engineering the relationships among business units and conforming to people's expectations and fears of how data might be used against them if you want the data to be accurate and therefore valuable to you. Because AI can mean using machine learning to find patterns in what happened last year. You know, those patterns might not be very valuable over the next few months. It can also be about doing optimization that's not limited by things you thought you knew, and that's different. So don't let AI come to stand for automated inflexibility. Don't let the investments you made in machine learning from last year dictate what you're going to do next year because the AI says so. It's going to take time to understand the implications of massive behavior change on our data sets. And we are working with this with tools like AI Economist, which was produced by our research team, to help policymakers use this stuff in a forward-looking instead of backward-looking way to guide policy decisions with, with really good experimental interaction. But notice that this is an interaction between human expertise and machine systems, not a replacement of one by the other. To get around this, I've sometimes pointed out that artificial intelligence is a phrase that takes an unflattering adjective because it's never a compliment to call something artificial. 
with a vague and not very useful noun, namely intelligence, because I can get 10 different uh, definitions of what intelligence really means. And so I've tried to put it down in terms of the verbs that AI represents, to automate, to predict, to plan, to recognize, to optimize, and so on. And the fact that we were able to get the acronym appropriate out of this only took a small amount of effort. I came up with the first five, and one of my people came up with the other six. But when you say AI is not a noun, AI is a set of verbs, do you need to do these things? And if you do, then there are applications for AI in your organization, but look for the thing you're going to accomplish first, not for a way to quote, do an AI project, unquote. This brings us to our second poll question, where I'd really like to get a sense of where AI is in the, uh, the planning of your own organizations. This is so interesting. So we have our second poll for the AI. All right, we got all our answers. Very interesting. Okay, not as not as big a none number as we had last time. So that's that's probably good, um, as long as it is in fact being used to to do you know forward looking and exploratory stuff and not just to automate last year, which is a, a, a warning that I hope I can uh, can share. Um, one of the other technologies that gets a lot of discussion is quantum computing, which again, people might think is a very futuristic thing. It is really no longer a question of whether it can be done, because now we have Google and IBM arguing over who did a particular key milestone first by demonstrating a task that can be performed faster on a quantum machine than on a regular one. And you know, once you get past those tipping points, a lot of things happen. One of them is that crypto as we know it basically gets broken, and it, it is not impossible to encrypt material in ways that are quantum resistant, but you have to get started on it soon. Uh, it is no longer a physics question. Can you build a quantum computer? It's an engineering question. How quickly can you build one? How big for how much money? And so beginning to think already about what information needs to be secured, not for 10 minutes or 10 months, but maybe for 10 years. If you have something that needs to be kept protected for 10 years, and you don't have a quantum ready encryption strategy, then you're kidding yourself. Uh, and and it, is not, um, it is not silly to be saying, is this a quantum resistant um, security posture? It's, it's, it's not premature to be saying that. Now, one of the things that's been interesting about what's been happening the last few months is the degree to which companies are rediscovering what they are. Bill Ford had some really great comments on 60 Minutes a while ago where he said, you know, People say, why is Ford making ventilators for hospitals? He said, you know, lots of companies can make complicated things, but only in very small volume. And lots of companies can make uh, simple things uh, only in very large volume. The number of organizations that are culturally and technically capable of producing complex, highly regulated stuff in massive volume is really rather small. And so the idea that an automobile company will become a medical ventilator maker suddenly seems not um, remarkable, but almost obvious. At the same time though, the girls robotics team in Afghanistan decided that their, for their next trip, the trick, they would design a low cost ventilator, which they were able to produce for about 700 bucks compared to, for the, the, compared to the $20,000 price of the typical ventilator. It runs on batteries. Um, for 10 hours. And uh, in a country, namely Afghanistan, that only had 800 ventilators until recently, this is considered a pretty useful thing to have come up with. What is in common between both Ford and the girls robotics team of Afghanistan is that they have access to cloud resources that only 10 years ago were still considered kind of sketchy and experimental. When I had data 10 years ago that showed people you can build something in one fifth time on a cloud platform, that was considered um, a, 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 an, an over-the-edge prediction. And yet now, a few of our people realize that medical ventilator hardware isn't actually useful unless you know where it is, if it's hooked up to a patient, if it's in operating conditions that it can actually deliver medical care and not just sit there looking pretty. They built a tool in four days Actually, they built it in less than four days because in four days we had it security validated and deployed on our global app exchange platform so that it can actually be put to work in healthcare points of delivery 
all over the planet. Built, tested, validated, secure, and deployed in four days. This is the kind of pace of doable change that we simply did not have in any prior global crisis. And it's really exciting. And, and I, I, I love having stories like this to share. But this actually brings us to our third poll question. Can we bring that up, please? Yes. When we start to talk about taking advantage of these capabilities and reopening offices and customer spaces, where do you feel you are in your organization? Are you actively planning that? Do you have the plan basically in place and you're waiting for certain trigger conditions to arise so you can execute that plan in appropriate stages? Have you already begun to execute that plan? Have you, have you partially reopened or so on? Are you fully open? Maybe you never closed. Or really, do you not have a defined plan? Do you not have a defined planning process, let alone a plan that's, that's in the process of execution? I'd, I'd really like to know where people are on that before I talk about the next uh, uh, topic. So here are the numbers. Pretty good. That's, that's, the, that's the smallest number for the uh, least, least good case that we've seen so far. So that's really great. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested by those numbers and I appreciate people's candor in sharing them with me. Uh, we, while we were also building you know, ventilator hardware management systems, we built a little thing called work.com. It was not in our plans at the end of last year. It is a complete console already being extended by partner offerings that allows you to do things like scheduling workforce cohorts and collecting information on people's exposure and symptoms the night before work and doing contact tracing and things. The last number I heard is that it's actively in use in a majority of the US states for their contact tracing. This is a product that had not even been begun to be discussed in December of last year or when we started our fiscal year on February 1st. I'm telling you this because I wanna emphasize things that people think can't get done in less than a year can now get done in weeks, deployed at scale in a secure way. And, and taking advantage of that is going to be the key to moving forward to taking advantage of this. It's not too soon to talk about not a recovery plan, but a growth plan. In 2021, several sectors of the global economy will be functioning at levels higher than they were in 2019. You know, the, yes, it's going to be a Nike swoosh recovery, but anticipating and being prepared to execute on those opportunities may not be a conversation that a lot of people think they're ready to have. And I urge you to be among the leaders in your organizations and saying, let's talk about what we're doing to come out of the starting gate strong, to have a running start while others are still you know, figuring out whether it's safe to get going. Be, this is not about restoring what we had before. This is about expanding upon it, building a more diverse global supply chain, not trying to go all domestic because that's gonna be dangerous. And to realize one really important thing, this is that McKinsey quote I shared at the beginning. We've got license to experiment. There are international events like the Basel World Trade Show in the luxury watch industry that every watchmaker in the world has wished they didn't need to attend for the last several years because it's expensive and they have to compete with each other uh, for the attention of the attendees. They'd much rather do an event that's really all theirs, but they can't afford to be the only one who doesn't show up at Basel World. No one's showing up at Basel World this year. There ain't no Basel world this year. Everyone's got a free pass for a year to, she to see what they can do when they get to do it their own way. And the ones who are actively embracing that opportunity are going to do well. And they are already doing things that two, three years ago, they would have told you, you can't sell a $10,000 luxury watch online. Well, the ones that, that didn't listen to the word can't are doing it right now. It is so necessary to do this. And don't think that being pandemic ready means that you're ready for anything. This is a rehearsal. There was some really good work done over at Deutsche Bank on the so-called tail risks. What are the tail risks? The ones they identified are influenza pandemic. Yeah, we're living that dream right now. Volcanic eruption that takes out agricultural production around the planet for a year. A major solar flare that happens to hit us and wipes out the GPS satellites and a substantial fraction of the power grid. That can happen, or you know, maybe a global war. Those are not even the worst ones. I think they didn't put uh, global warming on that one because they thought it would take too long to be effective, but this is material that's just from last week, the, the 12th, 
where they're finding out that the Thwaites Glacier down in Antarctica is melting a lot more quickly than they thought it would. And when that champagne cork uh, gets popped, an awful lot of sea level rise is going to happen in a small number of years. What I'm saying is not that we're all doomed. What I'm saying is there are going to be massive disruptive changes happening in our world and our lives indefinitely, and building organizations that are resilient and can handle them well is going to be worth the time. What do I mean by building for resilience? There's a thing called Conway's Law. It says whenever an organization does something, it winds up building its organization chart because the modules of the solution have to interact and they interact along the boundaries of the organization itself. The corollary is that to do something genuinely new, you have to be prepared to change your organization, which in many companies is much harder to do. They think they're innovative, but they're trying to innovate within the confines of an org chart that looks like it did 20, 30, 40 years ago. If you're not prepared to tear up the organization chart and build a multidisciplinary team, you may have difficulty doing something genuinely disruptive. You also want to be aware of something called Goodhart's Law, which is that once you pick a number and make it a target, it stops being a good measure. My favorite example, if I reward you for how many nails you made, I'm going to get lots and lots of little wire brads. And if I reward you for the total weight of the nails you make, I might get a pile of railroad spikes. What I actually wanted was some basic nails with which I can build a house. But because I picked a target, it wound up warping your behavior and changing your process. So asking yourself anytime you're about to declare that you're going to be data driven based on some target piece of data, ask yourself what the worst possible warping of people's behavior might be and assume that that's what will happen. One of the ways to avoid this is the bumblebee tuna law of project naming. Their marketing officer once said they had a simple rule. No project can be named for a technology that it adopts, only for a business outcome that it achieves. And if every project, every time it's mentioned, has the reason it's being done in the name instead of the technology it's deploying, this is one of the ways to avoid the problems of Goodhart's Law and Conway's Law. And finally, Hooten's rule, simplicate and add lightness. This is often attributed to Anthony Colin Bruce Chapman over at uh, Lotus Cars, but Hooten said it first, but Chapman said it very well. Power makes you faster when you're going straight. Being light makes you faster everywhere. And building organizations for maneuverability rather than power is an alien discipline in many cultures, and it's worth some effort to produce. Let's take a quick look at poll question number four, and I'm only about five minutes from the end. Do you feel that your organization's customers, clients, patients, students, other are currently being frustrated that they can't get you online? They know you're online, but they're not using it. They're actively using everything. You're actually growing your market because people discover that you're by far the most accessible out there or worst possible answer, you are losing customers in droves because when you shut your doors, you disappeared from the planet. Neil, I'm assuming this is all anonymous data and people will give us honest answers. Yes, this is all oh, anonymous good. data. Okay. So, so please, yes, be, so you be, can- be it here. It may be painful, but you, your, your name and, and organization name will not be attached to these results. Right, so you can Perfect. answer here. Yeah. We're still and getting few results. I'm literally three slides in a poll from the end. Okay, I think we're ready to share the results. I'd love to see the results. Here they are. Okay, leaving us in droves is a real small number and that's great. And look at actively using digital means. Okay, we've got almost a three-way tie and that is very interesting. All right, I appreciate people sharing that. And now I wanna to go to just one concluding thought. Before Warren Buffett was the world's superstar investor, a guy named John Templeton ran the Templeton Growth Fund, and he was famous for the statement, the four most expensive words in the language are, this time it's different. Because something will happen and people say, ah, yeah, but, but, but this time it's different. This time it's not gonna hurt. This time we're gonna do this. Well, the problem is, and this is as uh, David uh, Rubenstein at Carlisle Group said quite recently in May, this time it is different. I talked at the beginning about the difference between this kind of a recovery and recovery from an earthquake or a tornado or a flood or whatever. This one is going to be with us durably, indefinitely, and building resilient organizations that do not demonstrate Conway's law, that do not break Goodhart's law, that respect Putin's rule, and uh, that, that whose technology people remember the bumblebee rule and always focus on why you're doing it 
not what you're buying or what you're deploying or what you're asking people to change their behavior to do, but why, what is the outcome that's going to be achieved? That I believe is how we're all going to come through this as, as leaders in our organizations and with our organizations as leaders in our ecosystems. So last poll question, please. When you were going into March, try to cast your mind back to that, you know, coffee shop owner in London, hearing this word coronavirus for the first time. When you went into March, did you know the pandemics happen? Did you already have mostly remote workforce so that going into full pandemic mode wasn't a great big shock? Did you have a really good pandemic response plan or had you actually been talking to customers, suppliers, partners, municipalities about the overall system level of response? Or maybe did you have absolutely no clue of what was about to happen? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm welcoming candor here. Very interesting results. Oh, good. I'll be sharing in a few seconds. <laughs> oh, interesting. Zero on two of them. That's, well, that's, that's enormously interesting. Well, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. That's, that's valuable learning for me. I'll, I'll close by repeating what I said before. This is the time to get off the pause button and hit play in a responsible, governed, technically solid way, but also a time to hit fast forward because a lot of things that people thought of as quite futuristic only you know, weeks or months ago are in fact production technologies ready to go to work for you and drastically shrink the time to respond to these extraordinary challenges and to create leadership in the ecosystems that will power us out of this going forward. So thank you all very much for the chance to be with you. And Roger, um, back, back, back to your stage and I'll, I'll leave when I'm invited to, uh, to depart. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for uh, helping us raise the awareness uh, of the need for planning for disruptive change going forward. Uh, both AITP and ACM, uh, thank you for uh, returning uh, to our stage. And we, uh, we definitely welcome you back uh, sometime soon. Uh, I guess it'll be next year, but uh, that's great. Uh, Thank you so much, Roger. It was a, a pleasure to, um, to rediscover the, the, the joys of being forced to, uh, to, to do a complete you know, annual mental reset on, oh, okay, what do I think is going to matter now? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Coffey. It was very interesting and eye-opener on all the things that you mentioned today. Like, where do we go from here now? Thank you, Neil. Just to, just to clarify, uh, AITPLA is uh, uh, essentially a separate part of AITP National. And uh, if you uh, wish to join the chapter, as you can see on that last slide, you can join the local chapter now without being a member also of the national. Uh, there are two separate memberships, uh, but both combined are much less expensive than it used to be. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if you're a member of the LA chapter, uh, we, we still have a, a national network that we can connect you with. Um, just for our future events, uh, we fully intend to have monthly webinars. Uh, we are, uh, in keeping with the state of California guidelines, are suspending our in-personal events until after, sometime after August. And all of our webinars are free. And just check the AITP-LA.org website for uh, the events. Uh, some future events that we're planning are one on blockchain, uh, which was probably the, uh, one of the earlier points that Peter Coffey mentioned tonight and is something that's kind of inevitable. Uh, we're going to have an event uh, focusing on uh, managing virtual teams. Uh, which is something that people are having to do now. And uh, we got some people that uh, are very good at it to offer some, some ideas on that. And then of course, we have a panel of chief technology officers uh, in November uh, talking about technology trends. So those are some of our programs coming up. And as mentioned earlier, if you join the chapter and are interested in participating on our board, you'll have a chance to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much, Nilu. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I guess we'll sign off. It was a pleasure. Um, greetings to some of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the friends I'm seeing showing up in the chat. It's, it's, it's great to have a chance to reconnect with the SoCal community. 
still have uh, sons in the neighborhood, but uh, probably going to be doing it by, by these means rather than by personal visit for some time to come. But Roger and uh, the rest of the AITP LA board, thank you for the invitation to, um, to resume uh, this, this, uh, this always enjoyable habit, and I hope we'll get a chance to do it again in, in less than three years. Thank Fantastic. you. Bye. Bye. Okay, we'll, we'll sign off for now.